So pleased to welcome Alison Leota back to Politics and Prose. Um, Alison is a staff favorite, and so I'm so glad to welcome her here um, for her new book, Speak of the Devil. Uh, Alison, who is a former federal sex crimes prosecutor, is the author of two previous mysteries featuring Anna Curtis, the first being Law of Attraction and then Discretion. While I loved both of those books, I have to say Speak of the Devil is my favorite so far. The story is Anna is working a case involving MS-13, which is the most brutal and misogynistic of gangs. Um, and when Anna's personal life, her relationship that she's built with the very handsome Jack Bailey and his lovely daughter becomes tangled up with Diablo, the leader of the MS-13, who is said to be the devil himself. Well, it gets complicated and pretty scary pretty quickly. If you're looking for a cozy bedtime read, this is not it. Um, but if you're looking for a really taut, fantastic mystery, you couldn't go wrong with Speak of the Devil. Uh, again, I'm so glad you're here. Please join me in welcoming Alison Leota to Politics and Prose. I, first, I just want to thank you for coming out tonight. It was so good to see some friendly faces. I always worry uh, when, when I'm having a book signing that I'm going to show up here and it's going to be me and my husband, Mike, and that's it. <laughs> and I'll be like, well, sweetie, I'll tell you. What. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It really does my heart good to, to see you all here tonight. And in some ways, these signings always feel a little bit like a wedding in that you see a lot of people you care about and you never get enough time to talk to everyone. So just um, if you could do this favor to me, this is um, my copy that I'm going to just pass around. Just sign your name. You don't have to write anything brilliant unless you want to. But I would love to have you sign your name just so I remember um, that you were here. And this is just... It's a really kind of special moment, and I, I appreciate you being here to share it with me. So I'm going to just pass this around, and um, somebody can just make sure it makes its way back up. I'd appreciate it. All right, so uh, let me just see by show of hands, how many people have read Law of Attraction or Discretion? What a great crowd. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's great. So this is this is number three in the series, I, which is kind of hard to believe. When I first wrote Law of Attraction, I thought I was writing one book, and I was just uh, amazed when my editor, Lauren Spiegel, whose lovely parents are here tonight, when um, when Lauren said she wanted it to be a series, and uh, and I and I kept writing, and so it's been a real pleasure working with Lauren the whole time. She's brilliant and fun and has steered me uh, and Anna for, for three books. So with this one, with book number three, so each time you write these books, there has to be a kind of a, especially with a sex crimes prosecutor series, there has to be a case, right? There has to be something the prosecutor's investigating, some mystery, but it has to kind of intersect with her personal life and it has to have some sort of personal connection to her and she has to be in danger, a little bit in danger, even either professionally or her health has to be in danger. In some way, she's in danger. And this time I was thinking, how, how do I make her really be in danger? And as a sex crimes prosecutor, as a prosecutor in DC, one of the most dangerous things that uh, I, I've seen prosecutors do is prosecute the gang MS-13. Who, has anyone here heard of the gang MS-13? Oh, okay, yeah, good. I was in Michigan, I didn't, I didn't see that many. Hands. Yeah, they're huge here. They're really huge, and there have been a lot of federal prosecutions of them lately. And talking to my friends, police officers, federal agents, um, some of the most incredible stories that I was hearing were about the prosecution of MS-13 and kind of the rituals and insider information about the gang. Um, and and there was one story in particular that that stood out. It it and became actually the opening scene in this book, which is there was this brothel operating. And uh, MS-13 was extorting it. This is one, one of the things that they do. They recruit a lot of kids in middle school. You have to stay for life. And then you have to do all these incredibly violent things. You have to kill ri rival gang members on site. The girls are forced into prostitution. And you also extort businesses for money. So MS-13 was going in to extort this brothel for money. And their weapon of choice is a machete. So they were all carrying machetes. And then, a, but coincidentally, it's just completely by coincidence, a bunch of police officers were going to that brothel just to do like kind of a knock and, and announce and see what was going on, not knowing that they were heading there at the same time that these machete-wielding thugs were going in. And so they knock on the door and come in, and the police are met kind of face-to-face -face with all these guys with machetes, and this kind of battle ensues. And once I heard that story, I thought, all right, I think that's the opening of my book <laughs> right there. So you'll see that. That's the first chapter. It's based on a real case. And I'll, most, pretty much everything you read about MS-13 in this book is real. It's all based on real cases. It's, it's the sort of thing where 
truth is stranger uh, than fiction, and in this case, it's scarier than fiction, and it really worked to make a very taut thriller, I think. So um, as you read it, just know that this is all kind of almost all based on, on real stuff. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll do a little reading, and then I'll take some questions and answer, and I'll answer them. I'll take answers, too, if anyone <laughs> wants to give them. So when I was in Michigan, um, I started to read. I usually, traditionally, I read from the first chapter of, of my book. Um, and I started to read from it. And I had my little nieces and nephews were there. And as I started to read from it, I realized I could not read it in front of them. I, and I thought, Allie, what kind of book have you written? <laughs> I skipped over a, about half of chapter one. So I'm not going to read from chapter one. I, I've, I, I now have been warned. I'm going to read just a little section. It doesn't. It actually doesn't impact the plot really at all. So I don't think it'll give away too much, but it's about um, being a working mom. I thought some folks in the crowd might appreciate that. At home, Anna established a new routine. She set her alarm for 5.30 a.m. and was out the door just as Jack and Olivia were rising. The office was empty when she arrived at 6.45, and she found she could sometimes be more productive during the first two hours of uninterrupted concentration than throughout the rest of her workday. Each evening, she tried to leave the office by 6.00. She made it a priority to get home in time for dinner with Olivia and Jack and to read to the girl before bedtime. Olivia would cuddle next to her, laying her head on Anna's arm. After the girl's bedtime, Jack would set up his laptop on the kitchen table and work a couple more hours. This is a scene you commonly see at our house, actually. <laughs> Sometimes Anna would still have loose ends from work, but usually she could just sit next to him, sipping a glass of wine, watching an episode of Mad Men on Hulu, or sneaking a read of Us Weekly magazine. She bought the classic parenting book, Dr. Spock's Baby in Child Care, to help her interact with Olivia. One passage stood out. It is not your job as a parent to banish all fears, fears from your child's imagination. Your job is to help your child learn constructive ways to cope and conquer those fears. She felt reassured. She hadn't banished all the fears from her own imagination, but she had ways of coping with them. That was something she could give Olivia, too. By 10 each night, Anna was exhausted. She remembered the days in college and law school, not so long ago, when she'd be heading out for the night at 11. But now, she was a working mother. That meant her days were hectic. She had to juggle her personal and professional tasks and learn new ways to be efficient. There was never enough time for everything she wanted to do. But she was happy. She loved being part of this little family. She realized that happiness wasn't having it all. No one had it all. That was literally impossible. You couldn't go to the bar with friends at the same time that you read a book to your child at the same time that you worked late on a project. You had to make choices. Happiness came from being content with the compromises you made. She made compromises between work and family, between Starbucks runs and Candyland games, between sex and sleep. And she was satisfied with the trade-off. It helped that she didn't have to do it alone. She could work while Jack got Olivia ready for school. He could do the dishes while she and Olivia gave each other pedicures. Anna realized why people referred to their spouse as their partner. And it goes on from there. So thanks to my partner, Mike, who I could not do this without him. Allie, what were the biggest surprises for you going from Harvard Law School to the U.S. Attorney's Office, mm, and particularly the, prosecuting sex crimes? The, yeah, the biggest surprises. Um, well, it was a job I really wanted. I, that was my dream job, working at the U.S. Attorney's Office, prosecuting these types of cases. Uh, my dad had been a federal prosecutor, and my husband Mike started as a federal prosecutor in a different office, a different jurisdiction, uh, a few months before I did. So I think I went in with a little more knowledge than most people maybe do. I think the thing that was surprising, uh, I was working the domestic violence misdemeanor docket, and the, and the dynamic, which I actually talk about a lot in Law of Attraction, is the dynamic of the domestic violence victim coming in, being ready to press charges the day after her assault, and then um, three months later at trial saying, you know, please don't press charges against my boyfriend, the father of my children, that sort of thing. And the decision each time that the prosecutor has to face in terms of do you go forward, or which is more important, the power of her choice or the fact that this might be a homicide later, that the next time you see her might be in a body bag. Um, and, and that was a decision that kind of weighed on me every day because every day you're making this decision. Um, and I was surprised by 
uh, both the fact that so many people wanted to, it's 80%, 80% of domestic violence victims get back with their uh, abuser by the time of trial and, and don't want charges pressed. So that surprised me, and it surprised me how much I worried. I worried a lot, and I was constantly thinking about it. I was at the office till all hours, and I was thinking about it all the time, mm -hmm. hoping that uh, this wouldn't be the case that, that slipped through the cracks and, and somebody got killed. Yeah. Um, so obviously this is based, at least the opening, on a real case and real people, and how much of it sort of is based real and how much of it is balanced with the, with, um, the creative in okay. order to integrate the stories. Right, right. Yeah. So I heard a lot of interesting stories about MS-13. Um, I, I sat in on a trial in the Eastern District of Virginia where these MS-13 members were pimping out 13 and 14-year-old girls at construction sites. They would just rent these big white vans, drive to construction sites, and entice the construction workers to come into the vans and, and have sex with the girls. And they got caught. You'll see that. That's in the book. Um, there's a, there was a case where, uh, this is one of the most famous MS-13 cases. This 17-year-old girl named Brenda Paz flipped on the gang. She was going to testify against them. And she was brought into the witness protection program, but she didn't listen to the rules. She kept, she it was very hard for her to leave the gang, and mm. she kept going back. They were her friends. She kept going back. She kept hanging out. They eventually discovered that uh, she had flipped on them. By the way, this completely violates witness protection procedures. <laughs> you are not supposed to go hang out with the gang again. And they, um, they killed her, and she was uh, four months pregnant. So very. Uh, very sad, tragic sort of case, and, and a case that witnesses who, who, are gonna, who are contemplating testifying against MS-13 often talk about. They say, I don't want to be Brenda Paz. I don't, want, you know, I don't want that to happen to me. People have heard about this. They know about it. So that's kind of the basis. For, you, you'll see that case in there, too. Um, and there, so there's this bad guy. He's called Diablo, the devil. And he's really based on a real guy. There really is, was this guy who was kind of going up and this MS-13 member who was going up and down the coast. Uh, up and down the East Coast and all through America, and his job was to kind of rile up MS-13. He thought that they were just like a bunch of jokers just hanging around, smoking pot, you know, just having sex with each other, but he wanted them to be super violent. He wanted them to be the real MS-13. So he'd go from town to town riling up the gang, and everywhere he arrived, it was this kind of one-man crime wave. And so um, it, that seemed like a, a good bad guy to capture. So that, that's what Diablo was based on. So all of those things, all of those elements are, are real cases. That said, there's this whole kind of surprising uh, personal life w with Anna that, w that gets tangled up with the gang. And that's all completely made up. That's, uh, that, um, I've been thinking about that since book one. Since I realized it was going to become a series, I was like, okay, okay, I'll, yes, right, right. So I actually, I don't want to give away anything, but in book one, Jack's wife, I originally had her, so she's killed in this, um, in this mysterious street incident. But originally, when I first submitted the book to Lauren, um, she had died of cancer. And then when I realized it was going to be a series, I thought there needs to be something a little darker here. And I quickly, I just crossed out one line and put that in there, and then this whole thing kind of grew from that. And I'm, Are the police, the community services, social services, are they making any headway in controlling or inf influencing these gangs? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I think they are. I think there have been a lot of really focus, focused and targeted uh, prosecutions of MS-13. We just got a conviction in D.C. the other day. Kate Connolly told me about it. Kate, there you are. One of the uh, AUSAs in our office got this really great conviction against the, the gang in D.C. And I watched these cases in uh, the Eastern District of Virginia, too. I, so they are targeting them. And in fact, they're doing so well that in, Vir in Virginia, at least, that there were all these little, they call them cliques. They're like little subgroups in the different neighborhoods. And they were becoming so decimated by the prosecutions, they were clicking together. Like there'd just be a few stragglers left and they'd click together. But it's hard. That, so they're growing virally. They were this, just this small band of thugs in LA 10 years ago. And since then, they've become this group of, people estimate between 50 and 100,000 members now in almost every major American city. And that kind of viral growth is very hard to stop. And one of the things they have is this requirement of staying in for life. Some, some of the witnesses, some of the gang members actually want to leave, but they can't. They're not allowed to. Once you're in, you're in for life. And you get in when you're 13 years old. And I'm not sure a 13-year-old truly knows what for life means, but, uh, but that's, 
you know, that's the rule. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a struggle, it's a challenge. The Department of Justice just named them, um, I think it was last year, an international criminal organization, which gives them different powers to regulate it, go after their finances, and there's a specific task force just for dealing with this gang. So it is getting a lot of attention. I think they're making headway. That said, it's, it's not gonna be easy. You have the impression that they're mainly the gang did start in El Salvador, and a, a lot of it, it came from El Salvador, but now it, it can be anybody. So I think a lot of the gang does speak Spanish. But yeah, so it started with this wave of um, Salvadoran immigrants that came up from the, El Salvador, from the Civil War in El Salvador, and they came up mostly to LA, and they were the newest, youngest immigrants, and they had no power, and they were totally picked on by all the other gangs that were around, and everybody was trying to extort them, get money off of them, and so this gang kind of sprang up as a form of protection against the other gangs that were preying on the newest immigrants. And, but the problem, one of the problems was that every other gang had its niche. It's like they had, you know, one gang has, has the prostitution, and these guys are the gun runners, and these guys have this territory, but MS-13 didn't have a niche, so they decided their niche was going to be just being the craziest, most brutal, most erratic gang around, and that's part of the challenge, too, because they're um, just unpredictable in their violence. So I have an answer. <laughs> um, Excellent. Not, not original with me, which is um, you can have it all, just not all at the same time. <laughs> I like uh, that answer. That's nice. That's nice. That's uh, a very positive outlook. What is, um, last time I heard you, you said one of the difficulties of writing was this, the solitary nature of it. And uh, you're a social creature who, you know, used to having professional colleagues and right. daily contact. You seem to have answered that question in the affirmative. If you're going uh, to, but so um, how did you? solve that problem. Right. Well, I wouldn't say it's solved, really. I, it, the, writing by its nature is a solitary event. You cannot really do, you can't really write a novel as a group. Um, but it, it helps, it helps a lot that I can bounce things off Mike, and it helps that I have some good friends who I can bounce things off of. Jessica McCulliac is here, and I, uh, she's also in my book club. We just talk about books together, too, but uh, I can just bounce things off of her, and that's really kind of the funnest part. Somebody chastised me the other day for saying funnest. <laughs> the most fun part. Um, so there's that, there's this sort of thing. This is, this is a great part. I get to come and see everybody and talk to you about my book and, and, that, and that's really nice. And you know, they, I just try to mix it up. I think I need to do more writers groups or something because it is a long stretch of a very solitary day. Um, so it's not perfectly suited to my personality, but I do love being part of this world. So I'm in it, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep doing it. And I actually just started with a couple friends. We're going to get together and critique each other's works and maybe try to just get a little more social aspect to it. Yeah. You know what also is fun? Is Glenn Kirshner here? Hey, Glenn. So research is fun. Glenn is a well, former homicide chief at the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C. And one of the funnest things is, go funnest, again, is go I go to lunch with him and he'll tell me his stories. He has this amazing treasure trove of stories. So talking to people like Glenn and detectives and police officers who have these great stories, who, uh, you know, there's bits and pieces of all of them in this book. And, and that is great. And I'm just having lunch and like listening to stories and I get to count that as research. So that part is really fun and, and just amazing stories. I'm very, very grateful for the help. Oh, um, this won't be my, your funnest question. But, uh, <laughs> um, where do these girls come from? And is, is there much, much publicity out there warning parents and teachers and girls of this age about this uh, possibility? Mm -hmm, right. The, they're just regular girls. They're just girls who are in middle school, high school. What I think separates them is self-esteem, that they have low self-esteem. I think these guys know and they prey on, and this is what pimps do too. They, they have a talent for this, an eye for who has the lowest self-esteem, and they target those girls. Um, so it could be anybody. I, and is there outreach to them? I don't know. I, I think in some ways there are, but I think as parents we need to do a good job. I think you know, I have two little sons, and I, I think mothers of sons have to teach their sons to respect women, and mothers of daughters have to teach their daughters to have that 
regard for themselves that is really the I think the greatest shield for them and and weapon throughout their lives so um, yeah they do say with the sex offense and domestic violence cases it's where law meets social work because even if we get a conviction on any particular case that's not going to change that much in that person's life unless they have the tools within themselves to kind of navigate through life and so Whenever there are cases like this brought, it's a team. It's not just a prosecutor. There's an advocate as well whose job is to help the victim find resources and counseling and that sort of thing and hopefully change the, the path so they don't get into that situation again. Hey, Ginger. Hi, Allie. Um, I was wondering, you know, we've talked a lot about what's real in the book and what's not, and I think everybody who knows you knows that Anna is a lot you and also a lot her own person. Do you find yourself forcing yourself to make Anna different than you in some ways um, mm. in order to get some distance from it? And um, so I'd be interested in hearing about that process. And also, has Anna learned from any of your mistakes? Has she been able to avoid some pitfalls from, from your experience? <laughs> yeah. she. Well, she's much more interesting than me, I think. And... Um, she, she, I, I really think of her as a very different person. I know people tend to relate the author to their protagonist, but I really do think of her as a different person than me. And she has such a different background than, than I did. She, I had this really nice, tame, suburban childhood, and she has this dark, dark background, and she brings that personal, uh, all those emotions to the table as well. So um, I don't have any trouble separating her from me, but she, you know... I think any one of us in this room, if we had the job of being an assistant U.S. attorney doing prosecuting these sex crimes cases, would have very similar reactions and emotions. So to that extent, she, there's a lot of me in her. But um, she is much more uh, troubled and interesting than I am, and that makes her much more fun to write than if I was writing about myself. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's how I do it. That, that said, uh, I... I enjoy the parts of her that are universal, that are all of us. There's a little bit, I think, of, of all of us in her, and I hope people can relate to her in that way. Yeah. Was in a series, mm. you, you sort of have to, at some point in time, loop back and bring the new readers into what happened previously. Ah, yes. And how do you handle that, and how much is there looping back if there is a certain amount or when do you start or right. it just it, you know it's all over the place right right I do I think it's important for my books at least I want each to stand alone I want a reader to be able to pick one up be able to get through it and not have read anything else um, but you do need to put a little bit in there like little breadcrumbs for people who, who are following the series so that they remember what happened before and they can see the continuity so that's definitely something I'm cognizant of with them to both keep the continuity and to make it enjoyable for someone who's never read anything else by me yeah but read them all, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, I have the same question as the uh, last one, except from a different angle. If, when I, this is sort of a general question. When I learn about a new author, I see a review and I say, well, that's, that's interesting. And if it's a series, I don't quite know whether to, to read the, the, the book. I've just seen the, re the review or go back to the first book. What would you recommend? <laughs> well, I want to sell the book that's out now. So <laughs> I would recommend reading this book. Um, and, and I think most authors feel that way. They want whatever book is out right now, they want you to buy that book. And then, um, and then they want you to go back and buy all their other books too. <laughs> but I think, you know, I think it's fun to read from the beginning and, and see the character's progress. You can also see the writer's progress. You can see how the writer changes and maybe gets better at, at writing throughout the series. Um, but sometimes it's fun, too, to, to start at the end and be like, oh, yeah, that piece of the puzzle right there. So um, from my perspective, any order you <laughs> read them in is great. <laughs> are your books recorded? Yes, there are. There is an audio version of all of them. Do you know who the narr narrator is in your books? Yes, her name is Tavia Gilbert. She's an actress. She started with the first one, and she's kept in touch and, and been excited about reading all of them. So she's she's been the reader for all of them. She's a lovely lady. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.